And now, it is my greatest pleasure to introduce our special guest and keynote speaker, Shiza Shahid. Shiza is a global entrepreneur and innovation advocate. She is co-founder of the Malala Fund with the Nobel Prize winner Malala Yousafzai and Malala's father, father Ziauddin Yousafzai, and she led the organization as its founding CEO. She is now focused on supporting startups, innovators, and entrepreneurs who are creating positive global impact. Shiza launched Now Ventures in Silicon Valley in partnership with the AngelList, the largest venture capital platform in the world. She is also the founder of The Collective, a community of leading entrepreneurs that come together to build collective change, and, and she is the host of the new USA Today show, Aspirist, which inspires millennials to take action on the issues that matter most. Shiza is passionate about leveraging philanthropy, venture capital, technology, and the media to drive scalable social impact. And following her speech, Shiza will be joined on stage and engaged in a fireside chat with Dr. Janetta B. Cole. Sh uh, let's uh, please join me in welcoming Shiza Shahid. Thank you for that generous introduction and for all of your important work to advance equality, diversity, and participation of all people. I am honored to be with everyone today and what an incredible performance by everyone on stage. Thank you so much for inspiring me and uplifting me tonight. And I'm so honored to be with everyone here in the audience. You are the influential leaders in your organizations, in your communities. And you are here because you recognize that diverse and inclusive organizations are better, healthier, and more successful. I want to thank you all for using your voice, your time, and your advocacy to create a more just and equal world. And today I have about 20 minutes or so with you, and I want to start by simply sharing my story, who I am, where I come from, why I do the work that I do today, and why it is so important to me to help others who deserve a seat at that table access that very seat. Because I believe it is by sharing our stories openly and vulnerably that we are able to break down the barriers that exist between us and come together and connect to further human rights and equality. So my story begins in an unlikely place and it begins with the story of my parents. Let me tell you a little bit about them. My father was born in a village in Pakistan. He lost his own father when he was nine years old and afterwards grew up quite poor. My mother was born in a neighboring city in a very traditional family. She was the oldest of four sisters and she was told at a young age that she would have to get married as soon as she graduated from high school, that she would not have the opportunity to have a career, that her only choices in life were to be a wife and a mother. She married my father when she was 19 years old, met him on their wedding day, looked around and asked which one he was. But luckily, they turned out to be an incredible couple, supporting and empowering each other. And they made the radical decision that no matter the cost, their children would have a better life and a better education. So I was fortunate. I got to grow up in a loving home in the capital of Pakistan, Islamabad. And I had a relatively good education. But beyond my bubble, I knew that things were not as rosy. Pakistan has the second highest number of children out of school in the entire world. It is ranked the second worst place to be born a woman. And at the time that I was growing up, things were getting worse. There was rising violence, terrorism, suicide attacks that I had never heard of in the first decade of my life in my adolescence were now coming closer and closer to my own home. And I just wanted to make sense of what was happening to my society and what was causing this rapid rise in extremism and this decay in the social fabric. So I did the only thing I could. I started showing up at the doors of nonprofits and asking them to let me volunteer. When I was 13, I volunteered in women's prisons. And in those prisons met lots of children who had been born to their mothers in prison and had never left because there was no one outside for them. 
I remember thinking to myself, 90% of a child's brain is developed by the time they're three years old, and their earliest interactions, their earliest experiences have such a large influence on their ability to live a life of dignity and to pursue their dreams. Who would I have been had I been born to a mother in prison? When I was 14, I worked in microfinance and microenterprise. I spent a lot of time working with women, helping give them loans and business training alongside a nonprofit where I was volunteering. I remember this one woman whom we gave a loan to and she used the loan to start a corner shop. That allowed her to lift her family out of poverty and send her three daughters to school. She didn't just uplift her own possibilities, but those of her family and her community. And this was something we saw over and again and a pattern that the data supported. When you helped a woman earn a dollar, she invested 80 to 90% back into her community. For men, it was typically 30 to 40%. So if there was a silver bullet in fighting poverty, it was economically emancipating women. But there were significant challenges to empowering women in more conservative communities in the country, particularly in remote parts of the country where cultures dictated that a man's honor or izzith lived in a woman's body and must be guarded zealously by the men of her family. I remember one interaction in particular that took place after a massive earthquake hit Pakistan. I was volunteering with communities that had been affected by the earthquake, and they came from more tribal parts of the country. I was sitting with young teenage girls who had been affected by the earthquake, and we were sitting inside their makeshift shelters. They were living in tents since their homes had been destroyed. And I said to them, let's go outside for a walk. It's so claustrophobic in here. They turned to me and said, we're not allowed to go for a walk during the day. Our fathers and our brothers do not want us to be seen by the other men. It was in that conversation that I came to understand what it means to be a woman in some of the harshest circumstances in the world and have your very silhouette be a source of shame. These interactions with lives and people and cultures so different from my own led me to a place where my understanding of the world was cut open. I came to realize the importance of cultural context and of looking at people and their ideas with nuance and with perspective. How could a woman have so much power that with a loan and some business training, she could lift her family out of poverty, but such little power that she couldn't go outside for a walk? How could some people be so violent in the name of religion and others be filled with the greatest love and charity in the name of that same religion? The truth is we all live in a world where we assume so much about others through our own lens, but we are all fundamentally shaped by culture, by our communities, and by our circumstances. And I believe that questioning our assumptions and beliefs has never been more important than it is today at a time in America when we need fewer walls and more bridges. Now, when I was 17, I got another lucky break. I was naive enough to apply to college in the United States. I didn't know very much about the US, so I Googled top 10 schools. I applied to them and asked for a full scholarship since I couldn't afford to pay, and my lack of understanding of how difficult it was to get in paid off. I got a full scholarship to Stanford University. So I'm very much the product of philanthropy because a wealthy couple in Santa Barbara believed that a middle-class girl in Pakistan should have the same education that their children do. I wouldn't be here without that generosity. But as I moved to California, to Silicon Valley, my perspective shifted. Here I was in the heart of Silicon Valley, surrounded by technology companies that were changing the way we did everything. And I began to wonder, were there ways to affect change on the ground in places like my home country, Pakistan, that were more scalable, that were more effective if I leveraged the growth in technology and entrepreneurship? 
But at the same time that I was becoming more interested in these ideas, things back home in Pakistan were getting worse and worse. There was a suicide attack very close to my home. I became increasingly fearful for my family. But in particular, I was most perturbed by an insurgency that was taking place in the north of Pakistan in a town called the Swat Valley. This town is fairly remote, and it had been taken over by a group affiliated with the Taliban. This group had become violent and begun blowing up girls' schools, and in January 2009, when I was a sophomore at Stanford, declared an all-out ban on female education in the Swat Valley. I remember sitting in my dorm room thinking, here I am getting this incredible education, and 300 miles from where I grew up, girls are being told they can't go to school. So I started to do research to find how I could help, and I stumbled on a video made by a little girl. It was a diary. And she was writing to the world and asking the world to help her. She said, this is my plea, save my school, save my Swamp Valley. And I remember listening to her words and thinking of Anne Frank and her diary. And I thought, we have to have more people hear these girls' stories, these girls' voices. So I went back to Pakistan and I created a secret summer camp. And I snuck out this girl and about 26 other girls from her community to this summer camp. And I had one goal, to help them tell their stories in a way that would reach the widest number of people and drive those people to intervene, reestablish law and order, and reopen girls' schools in the Swamp Valley. We cannot talk about the Taliban, so we talk about childhood dreams. And the reason he says that is because the condition upon which he was allowed to film a small portion of that camp was that he wouldn't ask any of the girls to speak out against the Taliban on camera because I knew if they did so, they'd be at severe risk. And while they were under my guardianship, I didn't want anything to happen to them. And several years later, it was a decision I was very glad I had made. The other reason is a little girl who says she wants to be president. Um, did any of you recognize her? Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's the same little girl who had made that video, who had first inspired me to create this summer camp, and it was Malala. Um, she was 11 years old when she made that video, 12 years old when she came to the summer camp. That's my favorite photograph of her from the camp, by the way. And to me, this interaction, looking back, really demonstrates the catalytic power that we have to create change in ways we cannot imagine in the moment. Because I knew right after the camp that the work we had done had been impactful. The girls got to go back to school because the government of Pakistan intervened in the Swat Valley due to a number of reasons. And the lessons they had learned at the summer camp would stay with them as they built their lives as schoolgirls and as activists. But what I could never have imagined back then is that one of the little girls whom I had begun mentoring, who had been one of the reasons I had created this camp for, would go on six years later to become the youngest ever Nobel Peace Prize winner, and one of the most... <laughs> so we must never doubt our ability to achieve anything, become anything, overcome anything, and inspire everything. In the words of Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So after that summer camp, I went back to Stanford. I graduated and took my first job out of college at McKinsey. At the time, it was a top business consulting firm, and naively, I had a five-year plan. I had decided that the fastest way to catalyze change in the industries I was passionate about was through entrepreneurship, and I wanted a strong business training to complement my impact training. I thought five years later, I would get to leave and build something at the intersection of impact and commerce. But I was just a year into that five-year plan when I got a text message that made my heart stop. The text message said, Malala has been shot. Malala had been on her way home from school when two masked gunmen boarded her school bus, asked who was Malala, and then shot her in the head. She was critical. I was devastated and flew immediately to be with her in Birmingham where she had been airlifted for treatment. I wanted to be there to help her and her family heal. 
But I wasn't the only one who cared. This story hit breaking news, and people all over were outraged that in the 21st century, a girl could be shot in the head simply for wanting to go to school. I started getting phone calls and emails from friends who wanted to know if I knew this girl from Pakistan who had been shot and how they could help her. Now, we know today, of course, that Malala not only survived, she suffered no brain damage. It is probably... It is probably the greatest miracle that I will ever witness. I told her once she was awake and feeling better, Malala, the whole world wants to help you. What can they do? And she looked at me and said, I'm really okay. You should tell them to help the other girls. It was in that conversation and the conversations that followed that I knew that Malala's struggle could be far more than a day in the news cycle that her story could be more than something that shocked the world and was soon forgotten. And I knew also that I didn't want her to be known as a victim. But Malala was 15 years old and we wanted her to get healthy so we could get her back in school. And someone needed to help tell her story and build the foundations for a movement that could help other girls access an education. I was 22 years old at the time, and Malala and her father turned to me and said, we want to start a nonprofit, but only if you leave your job and run it and start it. Um, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't terrified. I had no savings. I have a Pakistani passport, which is the worst travel document in the world. Um, but I knew that it was now or never, and I took the leap and I never looked back. I share this because I believe in our lives, in our values, in our relationships. There are certain moments where we have to make critical decisions about who we are. This was one of those moments for me. And I know it's a cliche to say, follow your heart, but it's a cliche because it's true. I'm so glad that I took the leap. And it ended up leading to some incredible things for Malala and her family, but also hopefully for girls around the world who are now supporting through our work at the Malala Fund. So let me tell you a little bit about the work that we did together. We spent a lot of time advocating for policy changes at the government level, pushing governments to allocate higher proportions of their GDP to girls' education, and also to implement measures that would ensure girls were learning something of real value, something that would allow them to rise above poverty and to get employment and to create a life of dignity. But we spent far more time in the grassroots trying to use our own media spotlight to highlight issues that we believe needed visibility and change. This is a photograph from Nigeria where we went after more than 200 schoolgirls were kidnapped by the terrorist group Boko Haram. You see photographs of the parents whose daughters are missing. One of the mothers holding up a photograph of her missing daughter, trying to get the world to believe she's missing so that they would help her. And this is a photograph from Jordan where we sat with Syrian refugee girls. We know today that we have the greatest refugee crisis since World War II. And on average, refugees are displaced for 17 years. That's the entire length of childhood. And we simply don't have an adequate response to refugee education. So two and a half years later, we were here. This is a photograph from Oslo where I went with Malala for the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony. And you see her at the back standing next to Kailash Satyarthi, the Indian gentleman with whom she shared the Nobel Peace Prize that year. And as I watched Malala go on that stage that Martin Luther King and Mother Teresa had spoken from, all of five foot two, 17 years old, with her headscarf, I knew that we had shattered stereotypes about what courage looks like and what girls can achieve if they're just given an opportunity. And so, with Malala's blessing, I returned back to my dream of using technology and entrepreneurship to drive more scalable social change. It was clear to me that something remarkable was happening in the world. A girl born in my hometown in Pakistan, for example, today, with a smartphone and access to the internet, has more information than a US president did 15 years ago. That allows us to fundamentally reimagine the ways in which we tackle the world's most pressing challenges. But at the same time, those with the resources to build technology companies 
did not represent the population of America or of the world. At the time, 3% of venture capital was going to women founders, 0.2% to black women, and that meant that Silicon Valley and the technology communities around America were only solving a subset of problems, usually for the cash-rich urban upper middle classes, building apps that delivered your laundry or delivered your tacos or helped you find a girlfriend. As one investor described it, taking care of problems that your mother used to fix for you. <laughs> so I moved back to California with Malala's blessing and launched a new fund called Now Ventures where I invest in mission-driven technology companies businesses that I believe can truly change the world, that can tackle major, major problems in education, in healthcare, in financial inclusion, but do so backed by scalable business models. And so I want to share briefly examples of the types of companies that we're now investing in. Companies like Lucy. Lucy is a startup that is creating a future where men and women can succeed as working parents. We know that the US is the only developed nation with no laws guaranteeing paid paternal leave. It's no surprise that it ranks 49th in the global gender equality ratings. And the lack of support for working parents, especially women, is one of the primary reasons that this gap exists. Lucy is a marketplace that helps provide new parents the type of support that will allow them to transition back to work. Things like parent coaching, sleep support, financial planning. They help save employers money by helping them retain their top talent. And most importantly, they help women climb the corporate ladder beyond their 30s and get into leadership positions and companies like Parsley Health, a medical practice that is taking a whole body approach to long-term health. Today, medicine too often provides temporary band-aids to long-term complex problems, a revolving door of prescriptions and specialists. Over 95% of our diseases are lifestyle-driven and can be addressed through modifications in lifestyle, in fatigue, in stress, in nutrition, and Parsley is a female-founded startup that is trying to integrate Western medicine with functional medicine, lifestyle nutrition, and stress management, and eventually to make that type of healthcare accessible around the country. But in my final few minutes, I want to bring it back to each of us and the impact that we can catalyze in our positions in our organizations because fundamentally all of this comes back to the choices that we make to use the influence that we have in this room and back in our organizations to empower those who do not currently have a seat at the table. So you must never doubt when you act with kindness, presence, and generosity to further one person that your work is transformative and you cannot even begin to imagine its ripple effects. It's the idea of the butterfly effect, that something as simple as a butterfly's wing fluttering can cause a typhoon halfway across the world. Or as the poet Rumi said, you are not a drop in the ocean, you are the entire ocean in a drop. Thank you so much for sharing this evening with me. I am so inspired by all of you and the work that you do. And I'm so humbled now to have the opportunity to share the stage with Dr. Cole and the incredible work that she's done and, and the way she's inspired all of us. So thank you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I so deeply respect, admire, and I can say love you. And with all of my sisters and brothers 
my siblings all, I can also say that someone who is so deeply placed in your heart, Malala, is one of our sheroes. I want to share something with you. At the place where I work, it's a company called Cook Ross. We do our best to live our values. And one of the ways we do that is to have an office that is filled with photographs of our heroes and our sheroes. When you walk into the office, you see Rosa Parks. You see Cesar Chavez. You see Audre Lorde. And you see Malala. And so, when I'm in our office and I walk by and I, and I commune with her, I'm often thinking about an African proverb. It says, if you educate a man, you educate an individual. But if you educate a woman, you educate a nation. Now, clearly, She's a, women were first girls. Why is this so frightening to so many in the world? Why is it the, edu, is it the education of girls can lead the, the Taliban to put the life of Malana in danger? and the lives of girls and women around the world in danger. Why? Thank you, Dr. Cole. That's a deep question. There are so many parts to that. And um, again, I'm, I'm so honored you to be in your, bit. I'm so honored to, to be here with you with everything you've done, speaking of Shiro's. Um, so there's, there's several parts to this question. Um, statistically, when you look at the education gap between boys and girls, a lot of that has been closed. Mm -hmm. The economic participation gap, the political partic participation gap have a long way to go. Educational attainment, by and large, we've made a lot of progress on that front, um, which is not all good news. It means in many parts of the world, girls and boys are both not getting a good education. So we know there's 130 million girls out of school today many more who are not learning anything that will actually allow them to rise above their circumstances, to generate an income and to live a life of dignity. So education is a massive problem. It is a very complex challenge to solve. Um, you, know, you think of a vaccination, um, you know, a polio vaccination. Delivering that to remote parts of the country, it's, it's difficult. You think of areas without paved roads, you think of refrigeration of vaccinations, delivering it on time, making sure local um, healthcare workers understand how to, how to immunize. And that's just a vaccine. It's a very simple mm -hmm. intervention. You vaccinate and you're done. Education is so much harder, right? And so you, have, you can build a school, but is the school close enough? Um, are the children so hungry that they're not learning anything when they're in school? Are there links to the job market so that they're actually getting employed once they graduate? Because if they're not, then the rational thing to do is to get your daughter married to someone who can keep her safe. If you're just going to send her to school and then she's not going to get employed and be hungry, then what's the point of the education? So I think there's a lot of places where the system has failed. In Pakistan, for example, government schools are barely functioning. Um, and so most people are struggling to find good opportunities for their children. Most people want a good life for their children all around the world, even if they're highly traditional, even if they have strong opinions about 
um, women needing to get married and, you know, very so strong conservative social norms, they still want a better life for their children. Now, there are parts of Pakistan and, and other very conservative societies where there are um, very old cultural norms that are extremely prejudiced and violent towards women. So this idea of is it their honor, for example, exists in tribal parts of Pakistan. And over there, a woman um, cannot be seen by another man. That is a disrespect of the men in her family. And those are some very dangerous cultural norms that we need to um, deconstruct because um, there is no room for them in a peaceful, tolerant culture. Um, that being said, that is not in my opinion, the predominant reason why women today are not getting a good education, the predominant reason is governments are unwilling and unable to provide it. Nonprofits, most of them don't have the scale to actually reach 130 million girls. Um, most of the best run nonprofits are very small. It's very mm -hmm. hard to scale mm -hmm. that. And so that's why I'm now in entrepreneurship and technology because we need to find more scalable ways to reach these children around the world. Mm -hmm. When I think about what you have done in being in partnership in a very special mentoring, supportive relationship with Malala, I think about you as being at one of the United States of America's premier institutions. It's called Stanford. Mm -hmm. And I would be so, so happy if you would share with us how it is that you came to the point where you could obviously say, my education is to help me to understand the world better. Mm. But it's also to help me to make the world better. Mm. Talk with us a little bit about what was in your heart when you decided to go from Stanford back to Pakistan mm. and to do some good. Yeah, I mean, I just feel incredibly lucky, right? I mean, what are the chances that I would have this life? I think back to my parents and the world that they grew up in, and here I am sitting with you in this incredible room with these incredible individuals. Um, I think those of us who are fortunate to be in this room have the ability to make a difference for others. If my parents hadn't sent me to school. If they had married me off at 15, um, then the only thing I could really do, and this is not to say that this would not have been a good contribution, would be to, to work hard to try and give my own children a better life and to try and keep a roof above our heads. And I was not far from that life, right? Just one different choice. Um, and since I'm on the other side of that, I have the capacity to not just enrich my life, but to try and change the system, because the system's unjust, right? Poverty does not exist in nature. Poverty is man-made. And so those of us who have the ability to think about these issues, uh, to do more than simply keep a roof above our heads and try and survive and keep our children safe, um, we can then think about these issues. We can then come together in groups like this and strategize and catalyze change. And so when I'm at Stanford University and I am in a class of 20 students being taught by, um, you know, Condi Rice and, um, you know, leading um, politicians and policymakers, mm -hmm. and there's this girl who's in the Swat Valley who's trying to get her story heard. Um, it's clear to me that I'm in the intersection of these two worlds. I can reach her and I can reach these influencers um, and leaders and I can have that story translated across cultures. And I think we all have things that are uniquely ours to do, right? It's, um, I was recently speaking at a synagogue and it's 
this concept of tikkun olam, the Jewish concept of, of healing the world. So if you see a piece of the world that's broken and you have a sense of how to fix it, then you've found your peace. Um, and I think we all have that. And sometimes we just don't feel empowered to show mm -hmm. up. We feel like, mm -hmm. you know, I can't even get out of bed and make an organic chicken for lunch. Who am I to change the criminal justice system exactly. in America, right? But I think it's not a lack of caring. It's sometimes a lack of, well, who am I to change this? And all I want to say is, you know, I know that the people in this room um, have the influence and the passion to do such big things, even if in the moment it feels mm -hmm. like, ah, 27 girls in a summer camp, you know, is it really going to change things? Mm -hmm. You never know. You've been described as Malala's mentor and right hand. Talk to us about your mentor. Who has been your right hand? I've been very fortunate to have a lot of mentors. Um, I think for me is at the core of it is a deep curiosity about other people and their ideas and their experiences. Um, I had the opportunity today to meet with a number of students here at the university who come from a wide variety of, of communities um, nearby and just learn from their experiences. and. Uh, one of the girls spoke about the high rates of depression in the Somali immigrant community here. Um, and other students told me how they'd experienced a rise in um, hate speech and racism since the election. And, you know, I learned so much from their description of their experience. And I think the challenge in America, and I say this as an immigrant um, with humility because I, you know, I didn't grow up here, but I have the privilege of traveling and speaking to people all over the country. And I think the challenge is we're not talking to one another anymore. We're not learning from, from each other anymore. And um, this is a problem amongst um, both si on both sides of the table, right? I'm on the coasts, and I think um, as liberals, very often we think people who don't have liberal progressive opinions um, you know, are not worth talking to and vice versa. Um, and to me, it's really about bridging that gap. Shiza. In the day and a half that I've been here at this very, very engaging and inspiring forum, the notion of fear has come up several times, and I know that Malala has said that this is something that, that she will not accept, the very notion of fear to do what is right. And you obviously, in your way, continue, I would assume, to confront fear and to put it in its proper place. So talk to us a little bit about, about fear and how you confront it and how you nevertheless press on. I think fear is a constant presence and I think the more we have, the more we fear. The more we achieve, the more we fear. Growing up, I was fearless. I didn't have anything to lose. Um, you know, I didn't have a, a reputation to protect or a career to build. I was just showing up and doing the right thing um, or doing the thing that felt like the right thing, I, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that we're often held back. The more successful we become, the more we feel that we have to lose. I think we're taught that there is an appropriate time for that, right? Work hard, keep your head down, climb the ladder, and then you'll reach a point where you can give back and do good in your community. Um, so I, I think that it's important to deconstruct some of the ideas that we internalize around that. I still remember uh, my husband in one of our first dates um, told me, you know, I would always describe myself as an activist. And he said, um, and, and at some point I was, you know, describing myself as an activist and um, on, on like my LinkedIn profile or something. And he said, you know, it's really funny. Um, 
Uh, in America, so many people hear the word activist and they don't think of it as a positive word. And I was really surprised by that um, because growing up, my, you know, it was activist, investor, entrepreneur, but activist was the, the primary way I described myself. Um, I was surprised to see how the difference in how that was portrayed where I grew up in Pakistan, where I grew up in America. Um, and I continued to use the word activist, but there was a moment where I thought, huh, are people going to view me differently? Are they going to be less likely to invest in my fund? I'm asking to manage people's capital. Do I have to act a certain way? Do I have, you know, am I going to be held, am I going to be less likely to be successful in this work if I express my opinions in the way that I always have? Um, and to me, it's just, you know, it is impossible to not have fear, I think. Um, if you have emotions, you have fear. It's one of the most primal emotions. It's what's kept us alive. Um, to me, it's about acknowledging fear. So it's, you know, all right, there you are, right? I'm, I'm on this stage. I'm saying these things. You're telling me in my head that um, people may not like me after I say this thing. I know you're here. Hi but you need to back off because I need to say this, right? Um, and I think that's really all you can do. And then, you know, hopefully you surround yourself by people who help you with that and say, you know what, you're okay, we got you, go out and do this. Um, so, you know, acknowledge fear, know that it's there, and then build the strategies and the support network to not be consumed by it. Mm -hmm. There were so many moments in what you shared with us through the videos, through your keynote talk that were frankly just, just moving. And so I want to bring closure on our conversation that I'm so privileged to engage in by just asking you to say once again how you see the future. When you referenced Margaret Mead, I must admit, it struck a chord. I'm trained as an anthropologist. I too believe, as she said, that we should never doubt the ability of a small group of committed citizens to change the world. It's the only way that it ever happened. But as we bring closure on our conversation, tell us once again how you see the future. Because I must tell you, because I have many, 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 many more years on earth than you, mm. I need to say to you that I feel that the future is so solidly in your hands, in Malala's, in the hands of that incredibly diverse, talented, moving set of individuals, young uns, who are on this stage. So tell us about the future. Well, firstly, I think you have, um, you've done so much incredible work on this planet. I think you have a lot more to do and, um, you know, you're not, you're not off the hook. <laughs> you're not off the hook just yet. Um, you know, I, I do think the future is bright. Um, I think that the only option we have is, is to be truthful. Um, you know, we've made a lot of progress. Maternal mortality rates are lower than they've ever been. Rates of famine are lower than they've ever been. We've also messed a lot of things up. We've, mm. We have more inequality in the world than we've ever had. And we know inequality is bad for everyone. Um, we have destroyed the planet and we're driving more species into extinction than, you know, ever in the history of the earth. Um, so I think it's important to take stock of the truth and of where we're at and to measure not just the things we're comfortable measuring, um, but the things that we're uncomfortable measuring, like um, inequality, mm -hmm. right? I think something that's very often left out of the conversation around human rights um, is vast inequality, a violation of human rights. I think so. Um, 
And I think with that, we're able to say, okay, where do we go from here? I think the only way you change things is by making sure you have broad participation, which is why this forum is so important. Um, I don't think you can have a subset of the population and a homogenous group, no matter how well-intentioned, solve the world's most pressing challenges. So I think, you know, showing up for the issues that we're passionate about and then making sure that we make room at the table for others who are not currently included um, is a great step in that direction. Mm. Mm. Will you join me in thanking Shiza?